We have been looking at Christ being the example of the church. Peter, as he arrives at Cornelius' house, gives us a beautiful description uh, of Jesus' life when he says that how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. That's in Acts 10 and verse 38. But the, see, that statement, who went about doing good, that's a beautiful description of the life of Christ as, as we would look at it. It's beautifully summed up that way. However, so many times people turn to other individuals, to humans, to be their example, to try to follow after them. Of course, uh, we all remember the commercials a few years ago, Be Like Mike. Well, that was Michael Jordan, of course. Mm, be Like Mike. Now, that was in order to sell shoes, but the the idea, he is the example. Be like him. Um, and so a lot of people will turn to sports stars, to Hollywood, uh, other individuals to be their example. But Christ is to be our example. Uh, Paul told the Galatians that he was in to avail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, Galatians 4 and verse 19. Of course, he had told them earlier in relationship to his own life that while he was crucified with Christ, he lived, yet not I, he says, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me, Galatians 2 and verse 20. He tells the Philippians to have this mind in you which was also in Christ. In 1 John 2 and verse 6, that we are to walk even as he walked. And so he is to be our example. We should be looking to Jesus and his lifestyle, his attitudes, his actions, as to how we are going to pattern our lives. So many times we don't. But we mentioned that he is certainly our example in prayer. And I stole, according to uh, Tim, his sermon that he would plan for today. So he had to plan something else. He told me that, I think, last week. And I told him a story of a preacher who had this young man who he was trying to train and get to preaching and he uh, was going to preach one Sunday, and so the preacher calls him in and says, let's go over your lesson. And so they went over the lesson, and so he preached that lesson Sunday morning, and he had to go home and find a new sermon Sunday evening. So I was just giving some, you know, giving Tim the opportunity to practice a little bit and getting up sermons. But Christ is a beautiful example in prayer. He was always found in prayer. His lifestyle was that of praying. Many times, every time before there was a major event in his life, he was in prayer. He prayed for himself. He also prayed intercessory prayers for other individuals. He taught us to pray for forgiveness, for blessings, against certain calamities that are going to take place, that evil might be cast out of others. Now that might be he was praying in relationship from a miraculous standpoint, but certainly the principle, even though there's not that demon possession, possession today, except as a person allows Satan to live in them and th act through them, because that's the way they have decided to act. But we can certainly pray for them to put evil away from themselves, to stop committing sin. 
He prayed for missionaries and the conversion of the world. He taught us to pray for deliverance from temptation, how we need such. He taught us to pray for spiritual progress that we would make and our spiritual development thus. And so he not only was an example in prayer, he taught us how to pray. But also Christ is our example in service. Jesus comes to this world not as one who, as a king we would think of with all of the pomp and circum ceremony that uh, just look the past few years over in England and all of the excitement and majesty and all of the papers and all of the attention that a, few baby, a couple of babies have received because they were born of the royal family. Jesus didn't come that way, even though he was going to be king of kings and lord of lords. He was and he is king of kings and lord of lords. But he didn't come that way. He didn't come to be served. And for man to do everything for him. But he came as a servant. In Philippians, the second chapter, and as we were introducing the lesson in Philippians 2 and verse 5, he tells us we are to have this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he tells us, uh, with that as an impetus, he tells us a little bit about Christ and thus the mind that we are to have. Because here he was, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But verse 7 says, He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. Being found in the fashion of man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. There was that humility that was in Jesus that would allow him to come to this world as a servant. The word servant there in Philippians is literally the word slave. Oh, we don't like that word many times and the connotations that it brings, but he came as a slave. He took upon him the form and the word form there, it's the same word as in verse 6 when it's talking about the form of God. It deals with one who has the inner nature of something and expresses it outwardly that way. He had the inner nature of God. He expressed it outwardly as God. You know, we sometimes if we want to talk about something that's 100% pure in relationship to an individual, his, he's this in and out, through and through. Well, Jesus was God through and through, inside and out. Doesn't make any difference. He was God in any way that you look at him. But then he uses the exact same word when he comes down to verse 7 that he was made in the form or took upon him the form of a slave. He was a slave in and out, through and through. His entire life was that of slavery. Now, we wonder how that might be, but the next verse really explains it to a great extent that here he is, he humbled himself. How did he humble himself? By humbling his will to the Father's will. And so, how many times does he state, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work, John 4 and verse 34. That it's not my words that I'm speaking, but it's the words of the Father. He gave me the commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. John 12, verse 48 through 50. He humbled himself under the will of the Father. And thus he could take upon himself that form of a slave. But he didn't come thus to be served as a, like we would think of a king, but he came in the form of slave. 
beautiful illustration of the service that Jesus was willing to render is found in John the 13th chapter. This is just before the feast of the Passover, verse 1. And this is just before he's going to be arrested, crucified, and put in the grave, and then raised. He knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world. He loved them unto the end. Because now then, he has joined or brought together just the twelve apostles, and here they are. And now then it says, starting verse 2, the supper being ended. The devil now having put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to portray. Jesus knowing that the Father hath given all things into, this, into his hands. That's, you know, remember what we were studying in Bible class this morning on Matthew 28 and verse 18. Jesus saying, all power is given unto me. The Father has given all things into his hand. He knew who he was. Uh, years ago when uh, this movie or this opera came out, Jesus Christ Superstar. It was a beautiful opera from the standpoint of the modernist standpoint because it denied the deity of Jesus. But Jesus portrayal within that opera was one who was confused and didn't know what he was doing, didn't know why he was there. That wasn't the portrayal that you find in the scriptures. Jesus knew exactly who he was. He knew exactly why he was there. He knew exactly where he was going. He knew at this point, all things have been given unto me. I'm that one who's going to have all power. So you look at that aspect knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and went to God. He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then... Cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Why would we see Peter's response in that way? Have you thought about that? Why would Peter respond, Are you going to wash my feet? Now, of course, Jesus was going to. But what's the objection? Why would Peter object? The reason is that here was his Lord and Master. But he was taking a towel and washing their feet. In the Jewish culture during the first century, of course, wearing sandals and dirt roads, their feet would get very dirty. And thus, when you would go into someone's house, they would provide a basin of water and a towel for you to wash your own feet. Or else, if they had a slave that they didn't really care for too much, they might assign him that, that task of washing others' feet. It was a task of, some, of someone who was not considered at all within that house, even as a slave. The worst of the job. Peter knew this. And now then, here is this one who he is called Lord and Master who's going to do that to him, for him. And Peter's rebelling at the thought, no, you're not going to wash my feet. Now, and Jesus, of course, answers him, says, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And so Peter's response, Thou shalt never wash my feet. He knew the culture. You're too good of a one to wash my feet. You're too honorable to do this, men, this horrible task 
of washing someone else's feet. Of course, Jesus' response, if I wash not thee, or wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And so Simon Peter, as he often does in his impetuous nature, just, well, not just my feet only, but my whole body, my hands and my head. And Jesus explains, uh, he that is washed needeth not to be saved, needeth not saved to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. Notice that, not all. Not everyone's clean, why? Because there sits Judas. The traitor. Did Jesus know he was a traitor? Absolutely. Did Jesus know what he was going to do? Sure he did. And yet, Jesus goes around and washes Judas Iscariot's feet. In verse 11, he goes on, For he knew who should betray him, therefore he said, Ye are not all clean. So after that he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again. He said unto them, Know you what I have done to you? Uh, those who try to bind foot washing and worship to God today, and they will use, of course, this passage. When they get to this verse, really they, they lose all credibility. Jesus had just gone around and washed their feet. And then he says, do you know what I did? <laughs> you know, it would almost be, well, of course I do. We just saw what you did. We know what you did. We know what that task is. How, how dare you even ask us such a silly question? You know, we would, we would almost be insulted at such a question like that. But there's a reason. He called me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. There's the principle. But what is this? It's a principle of service. I've given you, he says, an example that ye should do as I have done to you. What had he done? Not simply wash their feet. Do you know what I've done? It wasn't washing his, their feet. It was an example of service. I've given you an example to serve others. Now then, we don't have time to go into the contrast of the many times in which the apostles, when they were all by themselves, they were fighting one another Who's going to be the greatest among us? And remember the mother of Zebedee's children, James and John, she comes to Jesus, and I think it's prompted by James and John, with a simple request. Let these, my two sons, sit one, sit one on your right hand, one on your left hand. Those were the two places of honor. As far as the thinking of that day was concerned. Of course, she didn't realize what she was answer, asking because those on the right hand would be going away into eternal life and those on the left hand would be going into eternal torment. She didn't recognize that, of course. She wanted for her sons the places of honor. What they argued about. And so, what is Jesus doing? You're out here wanting places of honor. Instead, you need to be thinking about serving others. And that's the whole point. This is the example that I've given to you. I've taken the lowest form of servitude to show you an example of servitude. The lowest slave in the house would be put to this task, and I was willing to do it for you. Now then, this is an example of service that you need to emulate. And he tells them, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that sent greater than he that sent him. 
Well, Jesus was the greater of those who were there, and yet he would serve them, shouldn't they serve others? You're the servant in that situation. You're my servants, Jesus could say. I'm the greater, I'm the Lord. You call me Lord and Master, and you say, right, that's what I am. And yet I took this servitude upon myself. You sh certainly don't think you're greater than I am. Then shouldn't you be willing to serve? But the same principle that we see in relationship to Jesus here is certainly seen in relationship to us as well. On one of the occasions where the apostles were arguing among themselves as to who should be greatest, Matthew, the 20th chapter, verse 26 through verse 28, Jesus says regarding that, that it shall not be so among you, that is, in relationship to greatness. Because he says, here's the Gentiles, they consider greatness from the one who stands or has others serve him. But it's not going to be so among you. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He uses himself as an example. I am your example in this. I have served you. Now then, what should you do? You need to be servants as well. Don't expect just to sit down and have others do everything for you. You need to be out actively serving others. That's the individual who's going to be great. We have a skewed view of what greatness really is. The ones who are great are not those ones who have others serve them, but they're out serving other individuals. Some of the individuals today who are greatest within the kingdom of God today are not those well-known names that we know very well, but it's the individual who's out on a daily basis serving and working for others, doing good works for others. That's the individual who Jesus says, that's the one who's greatest among you. We're to be servants. In Matthew, the 25th chapter, as Jesus, in this chapter, he gives uh, first uh, the parable of the foolish. Ten foolish virgins, ten, or five foolish and five wise, because some were not prepared and some were. Then the parable of the talents, in which he would give certain talents or abilities. Two of them used them properly, and thus were rewarded. One of them failed to use it properly, and thus he was condemned. And then, starting in verse 31, he gives us a scene of the judgment. That the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit on the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. And then shall the king say to those on the right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In other words, you're going to be able to go into heaven itself. You're going to be given that eternal life with God where you will be ever blessed. But notice what he bases it on. Because you were baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins, and because you attended all of the services of the church, 
Y'all don't find that there, do you? Brethren, what do we base faithfulness upon? <laughs> now, if someone is here all the time, attending all the time, what do we say? That person's faithful, isn't he? If someone starts missing here and there, why, they're no longer faithful. Our idea so many times of faithfulness is simply if they're attending services. Now, person, you have to be baptized for remission of sin. And there's no doubt about it. You have to be in order to be saved. You can't be saved without such. But that's not the idea of faithfulness, and that's not the basis of judgment. Not what Jesus is saying here. Go back into Job sometime and read Job. Because he's got his three friends. Aren't very good friends, are they? Who are always telling him, you sinned. That's why these things are happening to you. You need to simply curse God and die. That's what his wife was telling him also. Job's response to this, I have not sinned, but sometime pay attention to what Job says in that. And how he says, here's how I've treated others. Here's what I've done. And he is defending himself and his righteousness before God based upon his actions in regards to other individuals. Now then, when you think about that, and Job is saying, I am justified. You know, at the end, when God asks him all of those questions and Job realizes, you know, I can't answer these things. I don't have any ideas to the answer to them. We still don't know a lot of those questions. And he says, woe is me. I, he's humbled. But you know, God never condemned Job. He did those three friends, and he tells them, you asked Job to sacrifice for you. Because Job is my righteous servant. What was he doing through his life? He was doing good in others. Now then you come back to here we are. Here's those who are going to go into eternal life. Come, ye blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now notice why he bases it. I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was a stranger. I was naked, sick, in prison. And to those on the right, he says, you ministered to me, you were servants to me in those situations. To those on the left, he says exactly the same thing, except you did not minister to me. You did not do these things to me. And as a result, those on the left hand, he tells them, depart ye from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? You didn't serve. These on the right hand who are going into heaven, they did serve. And so those on the left hand and said, these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Who's the righteous? It's those who served others. Those who were in need and here's these individuals who are righteous who are serving those who are in need. That's the basis of the righteousness. We already read in John 13 and verse 15 how that Jesus says, I've left you an, or I've given you an example that you should do as I have done. But the example was that of serving. Now, we are to be servants as well. In Romans 12th chapter and verse 1, Paul begins this beautiful chapter that deals so beautifully with the Christian life. 
but he begins it by saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable in God, which is your reasonable service. Notice the service. We are have to be a, and he's dealing with a lifetime of service. And yes, it goes back, if you go back to the Romans 6 chapter, it's dealing with that baptism in water and how that when they were baptized, they presented their bodies as a living sacrifice, but that living sacrifice was to be a life of service. Instead of reasonable, some say spiritual service. It is though something that is reasonable, it's logical. We get our word logical from the word that's translated reasonable here. This is your logical reaction to presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. In that act of baptism, you are raised to walk in newness of life, but that newness of life now is a life of Reasonable service. In James 1 and in verse 27, James would tell us pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. What is pure religion? Well, yes, it's dealing with being unspotted from the world and not uh, uh, allowing the taint and the sin of the world to come upon us. But the other aspect of that is it's a life of service. Here's the fatherless and widows, or the orphans and widows. And really, fatherless is the pr proper idea, even though it can be translated orphans. Someone who is bereft of family or of parents and whatever that might, might bring. And he says, you visit them. What is it? The visit, though, is a word which means to attend to their needs. You attend to the needs of that individual who is fatherless or that widow and the afflictions that they have. They're going to have certain problems within their life and those needs need to be taken care of. You are to serve them. That's what pure religion is dealing with, a life of service. It's something that we can all engage in. We can serve in various ways, but we are all to be servants. You might be able to serve in certain ways that I would never be able to. I might be able to serve in other ways in which you might not be able to. But we can all engage in our activities in serving others. Christ was a beautiful example of such. We need to walk in his steps in serving others. Becoming a Christian, yes. By our faith and repentance and confession of our faith and being baptized in water, yes. That baptism being for the remission of our sins, absolutely. But then living that life because we have presented our bodies now as a living service or as a living sacrifice to serve others. So if you haven't been that type of servant that God would want you to be, then why not change your life and your lifestyle, change your thinking to attune to the t thinking of Christ. And here he was, our Lord and Master, yet he was willing to take the lowly lowliest of servants or of slaves' job and do it himself in order to serve others and be a servant in all the ways that we can and doing what we can to further the cause of Christ. So if you need this afternoon to obey the gospel or you need to repent and make things right because of sin within your life, 
We would encourage you to do that as we stand and sing the invitation song.